Um, my name is Heather Gonley. I'm Senior Fellow and Director of the Europe Program here at CSIS. And uh, welcome. We're delighted to uh, be a, a partner of the European Union delegation to co-sponsor an EU rendezvous event. And we have a rendezvous for you this afternoon, I assure you. Uh, we are delighted to, to welcome uh, three colleagues uh, to help us get a better sense of uh, the European Union's data privacy rules in a digital economy, truly from a transatlantic perspective uh, with us. And again, we are delighted to welcome uh, Francoise Lebal, uh, Lebal, Director General for Justice in the European Commission, uh, was appointed in this newly created uh, DG Justice position on July 1st of 2010. And prior to that, Francoise uh, was the Deputy Director General for DG Enterprise and Industry, had a great deal of involvement with uh, small and medium enterprise policy, innovation, and regulation. And we are, oh, and we'll get you some water. We are welcome, uh, we welcome you, Francoise, to, with us today. Her transatlantic partner uh, with us is Julie Brill, Commissioner of the Federal Trade Commission, appointed uh, July, uh, July 6, uh, 2010. Uh, prior to becoming uh, Commissioner, Julie was the Senior Deputy Attorney General and Chief of Consumer Protection and Antitrust, that's a title, uh, for the North Carolina Department of Justice. And uh, uh, she has held prestigious positions as a lecturer at the Columbia University School of Law. And uh, providing the private sector uh, opinion and approach, we have with us Mary Snap, Vice President and Deputy Dire General Counsel of Microsoft, uh, of the Products and Services Division in Microsoft's Law and Corporate Affairs Department. Uh, Mary has held uh, many senior positions uh, at Microsoft and various teams, and uh, we are a 23-year veteran. Uh, she knows this industry and uh, very, very well, and we're very appreciative for her opinion as well. Um, your cruise director for this conversation will be Dr. Jim Lewis. <laughs> yes, you didn't think cruise director was on that. Uh, Jim is our, uh, the, directs our technology and public policy program and uh, has also had an event uh, this morning. So he is a double, double header today of uh, CSIS. Jim and I um, collaborate on a transatlantic cybersecurity dialogue project. Again, a wonderful program sponsored by the EU delegation. And uh, so we just, we're delighted that we can provide this opportunity to continue to talk impor about important transatlantic issues and privacy and getting uh, the digital economy invigorated in the transatlantic economy is one such thing. So with that, Francoise, we'll have you begin and work down the table. And Jim, take it away. Thank you all for being with us. And uh, we're delighted again to partner with the EU delegation. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, and um, I'm very happy to be here um, in Washington to, take, uh, to talk about a, a, an issue with, which is of um, interest for um, everybody uh, who has a telephone, um, a computer, uh, who buys things on the internet. And I think what is very striking this afternoon, and you, you have here three people who are trying to get the right answer to the same problem. Um, what what to do about privacy and how we are going to make sure that uh, all uh, these uh, citizens who are uh, using uh, the um, internet and uh, who of course will use the internet um, increasingly um, are going to be protected. And uh, when I'm talking about uh, being protected and uh, having rights and enforced rights, uh, I'm not talking about putting barriers to stop technology. It's quite the opposite. And we uh, believe that certainly when trying to get the answer to uh, uh, privacy, uh, we have at the same time to make sure that uh, although people are protected, we are also uh, certain uh, to uh, help the development of technology and um, also to help this business development uh, on which uh, the uh, economy in, is very much uh, relying uh, on for the future. So let me uh, uh, try to explain to you what um, uh, the sort of answer we uh, are trying to figure out um, in the, in the uh, EU. 
Uh, first of all, in the EU, um, we are not starting from scratch. We already have a legislation on uh, on privacy. It's a legislation which date back, dates back 17 years, and the, it was time to, uh, uh, to to update it. To update it because, uh, of course, technology has to change the landscape beyond uh, recognition. But I'm saying this because what we are doing in this reform is not to, to change in things beyond recognition. There are many principles, many ideas which are already in the legislation that uh, uh, in the existing legislation we, which, which are kept and which are uh, uh, developed. And um, three points on this. First of all, what we are trying to do is uh, uh, to make sure that people are in control of their data. And this is crucially important because when you ask a citizen in the EU, but also in the US, uh, what worries them about the internet? It's, uh, of course, uh, what happens on uh, the, on of uh, their data, uh, you know, they put on the net uh, absolutely regularly. And we believe that uh, there are uh, a number of uh, rights uh, that uh, have to be very clearly uh, defined and uh, enforced, which will help citizens to be in control of their data. And all this is uh, things like um, the access to the data. This is, uh, of course, uh, consent. And I'm sure we will come back in the discussion on consent, consent, which means to be aware of uh, what's going to happen to your data and agree to it in a way which is uh, uh, simple and uh, which is uh, not going, which is not uh, uh, going to imply, uh, uh, you know, consenting all the time. But I mean, con consenting once, uh, once, and uh, and uh, not creating any uh, uh, consent fatigue, as uh, we have been told uh, repeatedly. But all these rights, which are um, uh, already existing, that but we have to reinforce and to, to make clear. This is the first thing we are trying to uh, achieve. The second thing we are trying to achieve is to have a single market of privacy. And this is crucially important, and this is crucially important for all these companies in the US or anywhere else which are operating in the EU. Currently, you have 27 regime, which is one regime by member states, because the legal instrument that we are using um, means that each member state is uh, transposing this provision inside the, um, their uh, uh, own legislation. So what we are proposing to do is to simplify uh, all this and to have one rule and also one data protection authority, which means that as a company dealing in Europe, you know that you will have one data protection authority uh, to deal with, which will be the data protection authority of the main establishment, which is a place where um, a company uh, will uh, uh, decide of in Europe, which have a representative in Europe, where the uh, data protection policy will be decided. So the second thing, uh, the second message I want to convey is that what we are proposing, it's a huge, huge simplification. And this is a, a, a simplification. We have put a price tag on this. It will be more in excess of two, two billion a year uh, for of savings uh, for these uh, companies um, operating in Europe. And Europe, as you know, is uh, 500 million people, and a lot of, uh, and of course, a lot of uh, um, uh, transfer of data, and uh, also um, a very profitable um, uh, market for this. It's a huge simplification. And um, the third thing, third message I want to convey, because um, there has been a lot of questions about uh, is this uh, new reform, is this regulation uh, going to stop or, or uh, make more difficult the transfer of data uh, between the uh, United States, since we are in Washington, and, and the uh, EU. And there, um, uh, what we are trying to um, achieve in this uh, provision on uh, international transfer is there again simplification. 
simplification, for example, through um, binding corporate rules, uh, which were existing already, uh, but which were uh, somehow rather complicated, and we are simplifying it again uh, by um, uh, the stopping the notification uh, uh, the provisions uh, that are existing now. Uh, so simplified uh, binding corporate rules. But it also means uh, plenty of other ways to transfer data if you don't have, if you're not a big company or big undertaking. undertaking. It can be done by a standard clause. It can be done also by um, codes of conduct and uh, many ways. And we have made sure that for this transfer of data, um, international transfer of data, there was uh, both a big diversity of means to transferring data and um, a much simplified way of, uh, of doing it. So uh, uh, again, um, the objective we have um, is to facilitate transfer of data, being sure uh, that uh, the rights of citizens as they are asking, uh, both in the EU and uh, in the US, are uh, fully respected. So this is in a nutshell, and there are, of course, uh, many more details uh, I can provide on, the, on what we do, um, and I'm sure we will do that during the discussion. Uh, but this is, in a, in a nutshell, uh, what we are proposing. We are proposing this uh, uh, with a clear legal instrument, and I'm sure we will come in the discussion with uh, Julie on the uh, various ways we are trying to achieve things us in Europe, certainly, with a strong legal basis, with a strong enforcement as well, which is uh, reinforced in this, uh, in this proposal, uh, with strong data protection authorities, with a board of data protection authorities, which will mean one single decision. Again, by opposition as 27 interpretation we have currently, so a, a strong governance of the uh, of the entire system, one one law, one data protection uh, um, authority, and and then a much more unified uh, um, scenery or landscape for these uh, uh, companies operating in uh, in Europe. What strikes me in all this is uh, we see, um, uh, including in the United States, uh, uh, these uh, changes which are, which are taking place. And again, I'm coming back to my initial remarks. Uh, we are all f trying to find a solution to the same problem. And um, I was certainly um, interested in the development in the state of California, for example, in privacy, where, where um, they are legislating on, the, on the privacy. I'm certainly interested uh, in the, the policies which are designed by uh, uh, big American uh, companies, and Mary uh, uh, will certainly say something on the, on the, the policy of her own companies. But I see others as well trying actually to reinforce their uh, privacy policy. And uh, of course, uh, uh, because there is this strong uh, questioning uh, of uh, the consumers, of the citizens uh, uh, for, for this. And of course, because there is no contradiction in between uh, protecting the rights and developing the market. And this is also a message I want to pass. We see a strong data pr protection policy as an asset for a future, de future development because the consumer is asking for it. So this is um, what uh, uh, we are trying to achieve in, the, in this uh, reform of uh, privacy um, in Europe. And uh, uh, we are uh, now um, embarked into discussion following our uh, own institutional process. And uh, I'm very ho hopeful um, that uh, in the course of 2014, hopefully, um, we will be able to finalize this, uh, uh, this, this strong uh, p policy proposal, uh, which will uh, reinforce the rights and clarify things for companies uh, operating in Europe. Thank you. Julie, why don't we go to you? Sure. <coughs> 
Well, thank you very much. And uh, thanks so much to the uh, EU mission for inviting me and also to CSIS for inviting me and, and co-hosting this event. Um, I uh, thought it would be helpful for me to um, address uh, the way in which we in the United States are trying to solve the precise question that Francoise um, indicated we are all working to uh, resolve, which is how to uh, protect consumers in this rapidly changing technological environment where so much is happening so quickly, uh, whether in the mobile space, online, or elsewhere. So I'll talk, a, I'll talk a little bit about what we at the Federal Trade Commission are doing to try to protect consumers' privacy. And then um, I thought I would... Uh, uh, close with a little bit of um, our work with our friends in the EU in terms of our experience with some of the things that they are looking at with respect to the proposed reg and our reaction, uh, both you know the positive and the areas where we're, we're in a continuing dialogue. Um, I did just get back uh, a few weeks ago from uh, Brussels where I had the pleasure of meeting with Francoise and her team and uh, spoke at a number of public fora and also met with um, a number of um, uh, officials both within DG Justice, within DG Connect, um, with the, within the European uh, Council and elsewhere. And it was a really, uh, I think, great dialogue. So. Let me just start, for those of you who don't know or may not be as aware as others of you are, I know there are many of you here who are very well aware of what we at the Federal Trade Commission are doing. We have really become, in my view, the nation's premier uh, privacy protection agency. And this is on the consumer protection side, not so much because we don't have jurisdiction with respect to the government's use of information. We focus on the ways in which companies are treating consumer information. And so in particular, we look at inappropriate collection and use of personal information, and we also look at failures to reasonably protect information from data breaches or other inappropriate use. Um, we have a multifaceted approach. Our agency was designed over oh, well, almost 100 years ago to take a multifaceted approach. So we engage in policy development, we write reports, we do studies, but probably first and foremost, we are a law enforcement agency and we engage in very vigorous law enforcement. Um, but one thing that we issued um, a little bit over a year ago now, it was in March of 2012, we finalized our big privacy report, which was designed to present to industry a series of best practices in terms of how industry should be dealing with consumers' data and information. It also was designed to serve as guidance to policymakers, whether in Congress or in the states or elsewhere, in terms of how they may want to be thinking about addressing privacy issues going forward. So we set forth three, prin three principles, some of which we see in the proposed reg. We set forth the principle, we didn't we didn't create this principle. We adopted and set it forth. I just want to be clear. The principle of privacy by design, um, simplified choice, and greater transparency. And we talk in great detail about how industry can provide these three um, elements in their data collection and use practices. Uh, I think that the report is was really groundbreaking in terms of a governmental agency setting forth uh, these um, guidances, and so I commend it to all of you. We have been working since then, since March of 2012, to help industry operationalize these recommendations. One of the ways we help industry operationalize our recommendations is by doing studies, and I'll talk about some of them. But the, probably the biggest way and the way that gets the most attention certainly is through our law enforcement activity. And we are very vigorous in that area. So as of right now, we have um, really the, the, all of the largest players within the internet uh, ecosystem under um, order, consent orders with our agency. So right now, Facebook, Google, MySpace, and Twitter are all under consent orders with us for various issues, which we can get into in the Q&A if, if anyone's really interested in the details. Um, these orders collectively cover a billion people worldwide. They require comprehensive, leaving aside the Twitter case, which was data security, but Facebook, Google, and MySpace, um, require the companies to develop comprehensive privacy programs that are audited every other year, 
And most importantly, perhaps for this audience, and I know for Francoise, um, and for others, of course, is that they require compliance with the US-EU safe harbor, and the failure to comply will lead to the potential of penalties. We've even already had the opportunity to enforce one of these orders um, with respect to uh, Google, where we entered into a $22.5 million civil penalty for um, uh, what Google was doing with respect to tracking co cookies uh, for placing targeted ads to Safari users. But these are the no these are the big cases. These are the cases that get a lot of attention because of the names involved. But we do many, many other enforcement um, actions, take many other enforcement actions involving the entire range of entities uh, in the ecosystem, internet as well as mobile. So we have um, enforcement orders out with respect to ad networks, mobile apps, data analytics companies, data brokers, Credit reporting agencies, a very important area near and dear to my heart, as are data brokers. Social media, as I mentioned, and software developers. And we address a wide range of activities, online tracking, data security, fair credit reporting compliance, spam, do not call, robocalling, and uh, COPPA, children's online privacy, is another area that's very important to us. Um, what I thought I'd do mention very quickly are the four areas that we will likely be focusing on going forward for the next um, year or two. And we certainly um, indicated that this was the case when we did our big privacy report. The four areas that we're going to be looking at in great detail are mobile, everything mobile, children's privacy, do not track, and data brokers. Um, I don't want to take too much time, but I thought I would just try to highlight very quickly what we'll be doing there because I want to turn, of course, to the proposed reg. In the mobile space, um, we, have a, we have a mobile lab. We have a chief technologist. We are looking deeply in terms of the, into the technology involved with mobile as, and per, in particular with respect to the responsibilities and activities of all the different players in the mobile um, community, the mobile ecosystem, because it is a, a more diffuse ecosystem, especially when you start talking about the apps, than are really any other, than is any other community that we're looking at. Um, we have done several reports, including how it is that these players can provide privacy disclosures to consumers when you're dealing with a limited amount of real estate and you're dealing with so many different players. One of the big questions, going back again to Fran the uh, challenge in question Francoise posed, you know, how do you do this in this rapidly changing environment? We did a report making recommendations of how the mobile community can give much more effective notices about privacy issues to consumers. We also did two reports on kids' mobile apps where we found that um, the ecos that particular ecosystem is not really yet um, focused on the type of disclosures that they need to give in order for parents to be able to exercise the control that Congress has um, uh, suggested uh, is, is required, and that is that parents be able to provide consent before information is collected about kids under 13 when the company, the, the, the online company knows they're dealing with a kid or they have an app or a program that's targeted to kids. So we've done all those reports. We've also done a, a general dot-com disclosure report, also very important. I suggest you take a look at it. We've done lots of enforcement in the mobile area. Happy to go into that, um, as particularly with apps, but not just with apps. We did one case that received a great amount of attention involving HTC for um, a Carrier IQ, which was basically a software data security uh, uh, case. The first one, arguably, that we did that wasn't um, focused on enterprise security, but on software security. So I suggest you take a look at that. Lots of activity in the COPPA space, Children's Online Privacy Protection Act. We recently finalized our updates to the COPPA rule. Um, I'm sure there'll be some questions about that, but I think um, we uh, struck a very good balance in terms of dealing with the way the ecosystem has evolved, and yet also trying to work with industry to make sure that it would be a rule that they could work with. Of course, we were just implementing congressional um, mandate, a congressional mandate to ensure that parents do have control over the information that's collected about their kids. Um, do not track. Uh, we called for industry to develop a do not track mechanism, which is uh, to give consumers some control over the collection or, so, or some of the collection and use of their information online. 
Um, there has been a lot of activity since we made that call um, over a year ago. Tremendous amount of activity on the part of the browsers, and I'm sure Mary will be addressing that. Tremendous amount of activity in terms of the um, ad networks and the DAA program. And there's a lot of activity right now within W3C, the World Wide Web Consortium, to try to develop a standard around that. Happy to talk more about that. Data brokers, I just want to mention really quickly, um, I think data brokers, my personal view is data brokers will be the privacy issue for the next uh, three, five years. Um, data brokers, unlike many of the entities that are operating um, online, first-party first, first party entities, or even the ad networks now, um, data brokers are um, largely invisible to consumers. They um, collect information both online and offline. Consumers have no idea who they are. Um, Many of them do offer consumers some choices uh, a bit to opt out or to uh, engage in correction rights, but consumers have no way of finding those entities. So I have made a personal call. Our agency has called for much greater transparency around data broker activity. I have been working with the data broker industry. I think they get it. They're try they realize they need to um, have much more transparency around who they are and what their activities are and what choices they give to consumers. They're struggling with how to provide that. And I have told them I would really like to see a one-stop, oh, a, a, a single web portal where consumers can go to get information about all, all the data brokers that are out there, or, or at least a bulk of them, and can exercise choices. Um, I th I'm still in a dialogue with the uh, industry about how best to do that. OK, let's, should I turn briefly to the reg? I, I, so, OK, finally. Well, we do so much. I don't want to leave anything out. But we really do a lot around privacy enforcement. And as you can tell, I think it's fabulous work. So, but with respect to, to the reg, um, we've obviously followed uh, the proposed uh, reg very closely. There are many of the same goals um, that, uh, that uh, Francoise described and that um, her uh, uh, colleagues in Europe, that they're trying to address, that we are trying to address here in the United States. Privacy by design, greater transparency, providing consumer control, appropriate consumer access to data that companies store about them, data accuracy, data security, parental control over information companies collect about kids, and accountability. These are all principles that I see and that we as an agency see in within the um, proposed reg. Um, we think that there are going to be many provisions that will specifically help consumers um, for instance, particularly some of the um, provisions around children. We see that as being something that is picking up on work that we've done. And I've been talking to Francoise, her team, and others about our experience with respect to the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act. Data breach notification, another concept that is built into the proposed reg. I have a lot of experience at the state level dealing with the data breach notification laws because here in the United States, it's pretty much done entirely at the state level. There's exceptions around HIPAA and other things, but pretty much generally speaking, it's at the state level. And um, we've talked, I've spoken with Francoise and her colleagues about um, some of the good things that I see in that provision and some of the things that they may want to think about what the consequences would be if each and every time there is a breach, the EU DPAs, all of them receive notice and what, what they would be doing about that. Um, so, I, you know, there's a lot of great um, stuff in the reg. Um, one of the things that we are particularly concerned about at the Federal Trade Commission is the extent to which we are going to be able to engage in cooperative enforcement with Europe, with our colleagues in Europe going forward. We already do a tremendous amount of um, international cooperation around privacy enforcement through the Global Privacy Enforcement Network, which is otherwise known as GPEN and also on a bilateral basis, country by country. We want to make sure that there won't be barriers set up to our being able to protect um, Europeans through the EU-US safe harbor, or that um, we, won't be, we won't have barriers that will uh, prevent us from protecting US citizens to the extent that there are European companies that are engaged in activities purposefully here in the United States that affect US consumers. So we want to make sure that we will have that ability to engage in that kind of uh, international cooperation, which we've been doing so much of and want to continue to do. So I think with that, um, you know, we, I'm sure we'll get into the discussion as we go forward. But that's a pretty good overview of what we do and our perspective on the reg. Thank you.
on and um Okay, it looks like I'm here. Thanks so much for the invitation. And the good news is it's, it's the themes that both um, um, Commissioner Brill and Madame Labai have talked about are ones that very much resonate with some of the work that Microsoft is doing as well as it thinks about its role as both a, an enterprise and a consumer provider of both devices and services. I thought I would start maybe just to lighten things up to tell you a little bit of a story, which might tell you why privacy is so important and sort of illustrate some of the themes on a real basis that all of us are talking about. As you know, I'm from the Pacific Northwest area, which is an area where everyone is very interested in being in shape and athletic and exercising. And we're um, home uh, as well, very close home to Nike Corporation. And all of the rage in the Seattle area, and particularly on the Microsoft campus now, are these uh, bracelets, these wearable bracelets. And you sign in with Nike and you provide your age, which was a little horrifying, your, your weight and your height, and it measures the number and, and how much exercise you want to get in a day, and it measures how much steps you're taking and translates that into fuel. So I bought this bracelet, I put it on, I put all the information in, I thought, you know, it's not too much that they would know about me. At the end of the day, right before dinner, I realized that my bracelet said that I had not gotten nearly enough exercise for the day to meet my goal. So I thought right before dinner, I just started exercising in my, in my kitchen. I started doing jumping jacks, calisthenics, only to realize my husband was videotaping it. And suddenly, I thought, you know, this is an unexpected use of data that's being collected by me that I had not anticipated. And it's exactly these sorts of non-contextual sorts of uses that, that we in the privacy world want to guard against. But I was the user in control, you see, so I immediately confiscated the cell phone. <laughs> and so it, it will not be seen ever again. But the themes here of transparency of what data is collected for what purpose and ensuring that the user remains in control of the data is very important. It's important uh, in the EU, it's important in the United States, and it's important for corporations who are responsible citizens in the data area as well. We have thought about privacy for a long time at Microsoft, and I've been engaged in some work on privacy since we launched MSN 17 or 18 years ago. And the work has become, as everyone knows, so much more complex and sophisticated since that point in time. I think it's fair to say that we know that consumers care about their privacy, and they rate caring about their privacy as important as they rate things like uh, um, medical issues or financial issues or relationship issues. But what we have never really known is whether consumers who care about their privacy actually can turn that caring into behavior. In other words, on the internet, are they modifying their behavior as a result uh, of interest and caring about privacy? So when we think about this, the themes that the others talked about, uh, transparency, trust, control, are all very, very important ways in which consumers can modify and can manage their privacy online. And as we think about the new uses, whether it's mobile or whether it's cloud-based uses or some of the big data and the mining and analytics, these are all different ways in which we can think about those three pillars and the importance of managing consumer and private behavior. So we have done polls, and others have done. We know consumers care about privacy. We recently commissioned our own poll, and we learned that in that poll, we, we uh, sampled users in the United States, in the UK, and in um, France. And we learned that about 85% of the people that we polled say they are concerned about privacy, but less than half of them actually do anything online actively to moderate their behavior. We think that we can compete on privacy. We think that we can get users to try our products and try our services because we offer a better 
cons experience for consumers in this area. So we're actually testing that. We launched campaigns a couple of months ago in Washington, D.C. and in Kansas City. We launched them in Europe a few weeks ago, and we are inviting users to go online at Microsoft.com. It's called Your Privacy Type, and to take an online quiz. The quiz measures how comfortable you are using various um, technology online and how comfortable you are sharing information. And it asks questions like, where do, you, where do you use the internet? Everywhere from your office to your commute on the way home. It asks uh, very high level questions about social networking and how you use social networking and how much information you share. It then identifies you by a certain persona everywhere from a privacy please to uh, all the way to the casual surfer. Uh, and you might imagine, and I would guess that all of us at the table are going to be privacy please kind of people. Um, but then it, it says, does that match with how you think you use information online? And if not, we invite you to take a look at some of the services we offer with Internet Explorer and with Bing and other of our products and services to learn more about how you can manage privacy online. We'll go back in, we'll do polling, hopefully we will learn that uh, these things do make a difference and that people will change their behavior in responsible ways in order to manage privacy online. Now, having said that, we're doing this because we would want to innovate in this area. And uh, Commissioner Brill has mentioned some of the work that we have done in the Do Not Track area with our Internet Explorer 10 and our Windows 8 product. And we're in the process of learning how that is playing out both with the industry and uh, uh, with regulators and with the ad industry as well as other website providers. We think it's really important to think about notice and consent in this new world because the ways in which people use services online are quite different than they were 10 or 12 years ago where you could ask for consent in a long privacy statement that virtually no one read. On the other hand, you don't want to be asking for consent 50 times as you're out uh, uh, traversing where it is you want to go to dinner that night and want to use geolocation kinds of services. We think that there's a difference between being secret and being private. And that in the old days, we talked about secrecy on the internet and having no one know what you're doing. And today, really knowing that people want to share different kinds of information with people that they trust. And being able to moderate those differences and make modular decisions about people with whom you want to share information is important. We do know that it's important to personalize our services. If we're going to continue to compete in the, in the world of the internet, we need to provide services that people find valuable. If people find services valuable and tailored to them, it does mean we will be collecting some information. So it goes back to understanding how the information is used and providing the contextual consent for that information. I think increasingly we're going to be starting to talk about when you expect to be anonymous. And not just anonymous online, but anonymous walking down the street. Um, whether it's you know cars or glasses or uh, bracelets or other kinds of wearable devices, uh, we're talking about sort of anonymity from each other in a way that I think will be really fleshed out over the next couple of years. But as we really develop at Microsoft uh, uh, a company theme that is built around devices and services, and notice I didn't say software, it's devices and services, it's going to be really important to integrate these kinds of services which deliver these high value kinds of propositions to our consumers. The only way consumers will take advantage of that is if they trust that we will manage the data in an appropriate way. We welcome the leadership of both the EU and the FTC. We were one of the early adopters of the Safe Harbor Principles, now over a decade old and still very much in force and very important for us to think about how we manage privacy. We welcome the dialogue on the Data Protection Directive. I know that Commissioner Brill and I would have a lot to talk about when it comes to COPPA and Do Not Track and uh, the Privacy Bill of Rights and other kinds of things. It is very important important for us to have regulatory leadership. And it is also important that we also have 
consistent rules that we can rely on that cross the Atlantic Ocean. And one of the key parts of that really relates to the being, being able to uh, manage the data flow back and forth transborder. That is important on the consumer side, but it is also very, very important on the enterprise side of the house as large multinational corporations host data for others and ensure security and reliability and uptime for the services that we provide in those enterprise and hosted environments. So broadly, as we think about it, the privacy is something, again, we would love to differentiate on. We think we are differenti differentiating on. But it does come down to balance. And it's a balance between regulation and innovation. We'd love to see companies compete in this area. We think that self-regulatory work is important, and it's important to hear from consumers as well, because without their buy-in, we won't be selling the kinds of products and services that we think will take us into the next generation. So thanks very much. We look forward to the dialogue. Well, let me thank all three of our panelists. Um, I think this was uh, an illuminating conversation, but there are some points you can raise. Uh, I generally think at a, a more um, <laughs> A strategic level and maybe we'll come I have many questions but I know the audience does too um, everyone welcomes any move towards harmonization and so moving from I thought you were 28 does that happen yet no, 27 to one uh, set of rules will be an improvement and in listening to both uh, Francois and Julie there were many areas of compatibility but when I was thinking about this uh, before I thought there's kind of a continuum here, and at the one end you have harmonization, and at the other end you have um, unilateral or extraterritorial. And so one of the issues will be drawing the line here between harmonization, not only within the EU, not only transatlantically, but globally, and where we will take unilateral action. Of course, it's funny for an American to be lecturing about unilateralism and extraterritoriality, but <laughs> we'll put that aside for the moment. I'm, I'm very sympathetic to what the Commission is trying to achieve, but there are three things we might want to think about. Um, the first is changing attitudes uh, towards privacy. And Mary touched on this. The survey data does not reflect behavior, right? And I'm surprised that you got as many people saying they were concerned as they are. And if you use a social network, perhaps you don't know, but you've given up your privacy, right? And so you can all do this test at home. Type your name into Google, or to be more precise, type your name and your phone number, your name and your one other piece of data, and see what you've got. So we have this dilemma where I have people telling me I care a lot about privacy, but oh, by the way, when I act online, I don't pay any attention to it. How do we deal with that? And this might be more of a long-term problem. Attitudes towards privacy are changing. The second one I alluded to, um, 20 years ago, it was much more fun to be in this business because if the U.S. and Europe agreed on something, particularly if we had the Japanese on, that became a global norm. That's no longer the case. So when we think about how do you establish global rules, you have to engage in some way. Countries like Brazil, India, perhaps even China. There's others, too. This is a global world, not a transatlantic world, and we need to think about that. Finally, and the concern I think we'll hear about from many people is um, what is the effect of the regulation, pardon me, what is the effect of the commission's thinking on new business models? And I'm, I'm a little ambivalent, I'm a little ambivalent towards this myself. I mean, you know, I've talked to one of the big uh, software producers for data mining uh, recently, and, um, you know, you can buy a lot of this data, you all know that, right? So you can buy, like, Twitter feeds. And people, this is back to the privacy issue, people tweet about the most ridiculous things, like arm covered with red splotches, right? Well, who the heck type tweets about that? It turns out lots of people do, and you can predict disease outbreaks months in advance, car buying patterns, house buying patterns, unemployment, the ability to use the statistical packages we're all familiar with to mine this data. Um, provides both opportunities, but it clearly provides risks, too. So how, how will we affect that? Uh, finally, um, we know from the last time that the U.S. and the EU engaged on privacy, the result of which was safe harbor, right? Um, this will be a process of negotiation, right? So one of the things I hope we can do here today with your participation and help 
is identify the issues that must come up in any process of negotiation as we think about applying this first transatlantically and then perhaps globally. I don't know how you want to start. As I say, I have loads of questions ranging from softballs to mean, but um, <laughs> perhaps I'll start by saying, uh, does anyone in the audience have a question? We will give you plenty of opportunities. We have lots of time. Go ahead, please. And could you identify yourself when you ask your question? Uh, Brian Beery, I'm the Washington correspondent for Europolitics and EU Affairs newspaper. Um, I think my question is more for Ms. Ms. Labai. Um, the U.S. has a, a law that's causing quite a, a fuss at the moment in Europe, um, the Foreign Account Tax Compliance Act, um, FATCA, the Foreign Accounts Tax Compliance Act, and it's forcing European banks to hand over all their um, customers' personal data, financial records, to the U.S. Treasury in order that um, the U.S. Treasury, you know, uh, for tax evasion purposes. Um, the European Commission has not really said anything about the data privacy implications of that, and I know the European Parliament has started to pay attention to it. But you have, you know, the, a legislature in one country telling um, companies in another country to hand over very sensitive personal data, and the Commission supposedly be, being the guardian of, you know, the European data privacy framework, why has the Commission not said anything on this yet? Yeah. Uh, so I gave every, every <laughs> one of the speakers a, a get-out-of-jail-free card, so <laughs> let, us, um, let, us, let us think about that. I think what you might say, just as a foot, and we'll, we'll have to think about it, and I don't know if any of the other panelists, but there is um, a greater degree, perhaps, of cooperation when it comes to money laundering and to tax evasion uh, among the finance ministries. That would be my initial thought in think in why you're not seeing as much reaction is that the the um, I know tax evasion is not only a concern in the US but let us um, let us take that one and we will get back to it uh, Mike Mike Nelson with Bloomberg government when I first started doing these issues 20 years ago, it almost seemed like there were two alternative realities. There were the European privacy commissioners who were all talking to themselves, and often at the same time somewhere else, the, the justice ministers were all talking to themselves. And often they were working together to share information in a classified environment and causing all sorts of anxiety both on this side of the Atlantic and overseas. There were lots of talk about Echelon and wi wireless, uh, warrantless wiretaps. And it really does seem that it's hard to have this conversation when everybody knows there's a lot of information being shared in the intelligence community in another realm. People just assume they have less privacy than they have. And they assume that governments are snooping, they're getting swift records, they're getting bank records. How do we resolve this? How do we really know what's going on? And, and how do we give consumers any sense that they have any privacy with regard to where their commercial information is going? Well, I, I think uh, the, 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 the question you're asking is exactly what uh, we are trying ourselves to, to, to clarify and give the elements, the tools for uh, consumers, um, what we call citizens ourselves, because for us it's a, it's a fundamental right, uh, not only a consumer uh, right, uh, precisely to, to, to understand what is going to happen to their own data. And this is why, first of all, we have these, these rights. F first of all, uh, being able to know uh, what a company uh, has on you. I mean, which is uh, not necessarily uh, uh, possible now, and have it done in a, in a very simple way and, and, and free of charge. Uh, having the right, for example, to rectify the data uh, which, which, which uh, 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 exists uh, on you, having the right to have them uh, uh, removed, um, if, uh, of course, with a certain number of conditions, and having the right to be aware when you are going uh, on the uh, on internet uh, to to know what you are consenting on 
and uh, uh, it's true that the government snooping on my bank records. Sorry? But that doesn't that does not address the question of government taking my bank records and sharing it with intelligence agencies all around the world. And well, so I, I, I might know what they're collecting and I might know what's shared, but I have no transparency in well, I mean, uh, first of all, uh, of course, when you are in the police and justice corporation, the rules are different because the uh, objectives are different. But it's not that the government can uh, mine into your data, transfer it uh, to whoever, uh, to whoever uh, without, without rules. So there are clear, clear rules. There are rules uh, uh, that we are uh, ourselves uh, uh, trying to address, uh, address uh, with, with both instruments for the commercial data in the regulation, very straightforward uh, and uh, and uh, directly applicable, and for the police and, um, and justice cooperation element uh, through a directive, where of course the principles are the same, and this is very important to convey. In both instruments, the principles of data privacy are the same, and then uh, of course it operates uh, in a different way with more flexibility for the police and justice uh, cooperation for obvious uh, for obvious reason. But what is important is that in in, in both cases, and of course with different uh, conditions, you are entitled to know uh, what uh, whoever uh, 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 has on you. And of course, uh, in the police and justice uh, cooperation, without uh, putting a, a, at, at stake the uh, uh, anti-terrorist uh, 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 actions and, and all this, the, the public security, the national security, and all this, which uh, remain a category of, uh, of their own. But the entire attempt uh, of uh, a building on the existing laws, of the already existing laws, it's to clarify all this and the, a citizen will be able to know in most of the, of the cases uh, what a company, certainly what a company has uh, on him and again have a number of rights uh, attached to it. You're looking at, so. No, I, I understand the question, and I'm, um, we ju it's just not in my wheelhouse. I mean, I really, we really focus on consumer data and, and information um, as it is uh, dealt with in commerce. I mean, that's just our jurisdictional limit. So I, I'm sorry I can't be more informative in terms of a response. Well, let me try a different one. Uh, so a few months ago, uh, I was in Asia at a, as an ASEAN meeting, and I was talking to a uh, uh, telecommunications uh, vice minister from one of these countries, and he said the following. He said, why does U.S. law apply on my national networks? Your law with the First Amendment uh, allows uh, online gambling and uh, pornography, and my law forbids that. Why does your law take precedence over mine? And what I said to him is, of course, on your national networks, your national law should have precedence, right? Where you should not have precedence is in the extraterritorial application of your national law. I'm not sure you like that. But the issue, I think, that underlies this, and it's a hard issue, is um, where is jurisdiction? What determines jurisdiction? It's no longer clearly physical, right? At one point, we could say, you are in this country, and I have jurisdiction over you, right? But now we're saying, no, there are other cases where you're physically not present. Mm -hmm. Sound like a credit card, don't I? And um, yet I claim jurisdiction. So how do, we, how do we decide how to s establish the boundaries of jurisdiction in the new environment we have or the new digital environment? I don't know who wants to. Well, in the um, regulation, we address this question, and uh, uh, we are saying that uh, companies which are not uh, based in Europe, but we, which are uh, offering uh, goods and services to uh, Europeans, uh, will uh, be uh, under uh, the, um, uh, the regulation. And the reason is that uh, uh, what we want to do is to, to protect the data of uh, European citizens 
And for the reasons you have explained, uh, uh, these data are not going to stay uh, uh, necessarily in Europe. And uh, the need to uh, make sure that uh, we, we need to make sure that these data, where, when transferred by these uh, companies, um, are going to be uh, continue being uh, protected. So mm -hmm. we apply this uh, this logic uh, to in in uh, the uh, regulation. Um, you know, we certainly understand at the Federal Trade Commission the desire to ensure that we can address conduct that affects U.S. citizens. Um, and because, as you know, you've pointed out, and we've been talking about, you know, that so much conduct does is, is extraterritorial. We have to make sure that we have the ability to appropriately deal with extraterritorial activity. In the United States, um, we have two principles that uh, form the uh, boundaries around which the Federal Trade Commission can operate. One is under our U.S. Safe Web Act, which is a specific congressional um, limitation on the U.S.'s uh, uh, work with respect to companies abroad or activity abroad. And what it says is that um, we will have jurisdiction where a farm practice and, and its effect on U.S. citizens is foreseeable, whether when it has a foreseeable injury um, that uh, uh, could impact U.S. consumers. So that's one concept that provides a boundary around our jurisdiction. Another concept, which is a broader concept that applies generally with respect to the jurisdictional reach of the U.S. courts, is a concept of purposeful availment. Is the entity or, co or company abroad purposefully availing itself of the benefits and rights and et cetera within the United States? And if there is the, a purposeful availment, then the U.S. courts, generally speaking, have um, you know, a, a reach. Now, one of the things that I chatted with um, my various counterparts when I was in Europe was discussing these concepts of foreseeable injury, purposeful availment, because I know that with respect to, you know, what I'm hearing from businesses is a, a wanting to be sure that they understand the rules that will ultimately be adopted in Europe and that the rules are, you know, appropriately bounded. And uh, they want to know what it means. And so, you know, this is something that's obviously going to be discussed a great deal as the re proposed regulation moves forward. But I wanted to express our experience in terms of these concepts uh, with respect to Francoise, to her colleagues, et cetera, because, you know, they provide guidance to business. They provide guidance to players to help understand when they will be uh, potentially swept up in a matter um, because they fall within one of these two categories. And, oops, oops, sorry, no, that's all right. I just would, would add on at a, a higher level from a corporate perspective, on the enterprise side, of course, we provide services such as our Microsoft Azure product and Office 365 in which we encourage our customers to to allow us to host their data. And as we provide support for that data, um, the data does flow sometimes outside the borders of the country where, this, where the server is, and that's important for us in order to you know, ensure that it is uh, readily available and for us to be able to provide maintenance and support broadly. So setting aside the jurisdictional question, the ability to understand uh, how we comply with regulations in each of those jurisdictions is also very important. So it comes back to where we started, which was harmonization kinds of issues. Can I, can I say a word on this? Because uh, I think this is uh, uh, the, uh, the beauty of having a regulation and uh, of having a clear legislative instrument where all companies can base themselves on. And what is important for any companies around the world is uh, legal certainty and it is uh, predictability. And, uh, uh, and this is uh, uh, what, uh, in Europe, we are, uh, are, uh, uh, we are base, basing ourselves on. It's really to have, to offer companies 
a clear, solid legal framework. And this is my opposition. And again, we very much value all the work which is done in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the US and in particular um, FTC. But there is a strong difference in between uh, having a clear legal framework. And we have seen, for example, uh, the President Obama um, um, proposing a bill of rights um, uh, some time ago. Uh, and, and there is clearly there this, uh, this feeling that something of this kind is, uh, is needed. And, uh, but there is this uh, difference of uh, um, of the, the, the way we, we operate, us on our side with an extremely clear uh, legal framework where uh, the companies know where they stand and where we can uh, also explain uh, what exactly it means for them. And of course, an American system where um, there is guidance and uh, Julie was saying there are plenty of reports, there are uh, of course plenty of reflection about it, uh, but it is very often based on voluntary commitments by companies, um, which doesn't necessarily bring uh, the transparency for uh, the consumers and the, the stable framework for, for companies. Uh, I'm sorry, just we, one of the issues is, is definitely a deception-based uh, jurisdiction that we have, which is based on voluntary commitments, but we've also been moving a great deal in terms of focusing on just unfair practices. So we do both, but it is a common law approach. It's not, it, it's a different, it's case by case. It's developing practices um, and looking at specific practices, looking at specific matters and determining whether or not those are either unfair or deceptive based on a body of case law that, that is extremely old and well developed. So it is, it is definitely a, d a different framework. And the question is how within our framework can we look at the same types of issues that are affecting, affecting Europeans, um, absolutely. Joe, I think you had a question. Could you, for the few people in the room who don't know who you are, could you? Uh, <laughs> Thank you, uh, Joseph Elodeff with Oracle. And I, I wanted to highlight the fact that if you look at privacy, both in the EU and the US, there are antecedent instruments, the fair information practice principles on the US side, uh, Council of Europe Treaty 108, the OECD guidelines, which embody the principles that, that both sides of the Atlantic share when it comes to privacy. And as Julie pointed out, they've taken different paths in implementing them, but the objectives of, of what they're trying to reach, I think, are fairly much the same. That being said, I think it would probably be not the case that we're going to see a harmonization across the Atlantic of exactly what the rules look like. But I think within APEC, we have a perfect example of not letting the perfect get in the way of the good. And the good is a mapping between cross-border privacy rules in APEC and BCRs in the EU. So the concept is, what are practical methods of interoperability that can help enable data flows while not creating unreasonable mutual recognition, but not requiring you to reinvent the wheel of something you've already done? Because it recognizes those elements you've met and then identifies those elements you still need to meet. And so this practical approach is very promising. And we see that that could be something that could come out of the, uh, of the work being done on codes of conduct in the multi-stakeholder process in the US. The, the draft regulation talks about codes of conduct. We have the concept of ways in which legitimate interest and adequate safeguards could be used in a manner in the draft regulation to also help create these methodologies where you assure the level of protection, but you do it in a way that is more flexible and adaptable. And I think that is also something that is beneficial and would like to support the continuing work of both, co of, of both the EU and the US in that space because I think it helps make sure that we address those concepts and it also is very inclusive of other economies besides just the transatlantic ones. That, that was really helpful, but where should I put the question mark? <laughs> well, I, I, think it, I think it was talk amongst yourselves. That was the topic. <laughs> Let me ask an easy one then, which and I think all three can, no, it will be easy, I promise. All three of you can address, but you know, how will the data protection reform change Safe Harbor? What will Safe Harbor look like after this? So I think all three of you could talk. It, will it be the same? Will it be different? Tell us. 
but well, f first of all, um, I want to be clear on this because uh, we have had um, many questions on this and the future mm -hmm. of safe harbor, and we have been very clear on this. Uh, we have said if safe harbor exists. Uh, we uh, are improving it um, every year. We started with very few U.S. companies in safe harbor. We have now uh, 4,000 companies uh, uh, which, which, which are part of the uh, safe harbor, and the safe harbor are here to stay. We have been very clear on, uh, very clear on this. I think we need to, uh, uh, to continue improving it uh, uh, over the years, but I mean, this is a, a strong, a strong ba basis for uh, further development. We've we've spoken with um, Francoise. We've spoken with um, Vice President Redding, and we're very um, pleased to hear a continuing commitment to the safe harbor um, throughout our discussions. Uh, so we, you know, since we are one of the entities that enforces it, and we're vigorously doing so, um, we think it it actually works quite well and is part of the interoperability that Joe was referring to. Um, I wish we were going to reach harmonization. I think I'm more of a pragmatist along Joe's lines and thinks, and I do believe that, um, you know, enforceable codes of conduct was another concept that we spent some time talking to our European friends about because we have a fair amount of experience with enforceable codes of conduct. And um, it was a concept that uh, folks in Europe are very interested in and want to learn more about how one actually enforces a voluntary commitment. So um, we did spend quite a bit of time talking about that as well. And, and I would say from, again, from the corporate perspective, uh, whether it is the um, safe harbor or whether it's model clauses in Europe or binding corporate rules, what we've really appreciated about the work between um, the EU and the United States is that it is the principle that is quite important. And then obviously uh, enforcement is key too, but that the principles enable the companies to continue to innovate, to potentially do more more than what is uh, would be required by a safe harbor, and that that is an important point for us to be able to continue to be able to work even on top of what might be viewed as the safe harbor in the area, because it's important for us in terms of how we think about our own business. Thank you. Uh, just a short one. Uh, Jim Berger from Washington Trade Daily. Um, on this proposed regulations that the FTC is, is putting out, I, my question is how much input did the EU uh, or the council or the governments or EU companies have in developing that regulation? Well, well the, the, the rules are, um, are uh, uh, I would say simple. We, we may you may not share this uh, appreciation, but I mean the the way we operate is that the Commission makes a, a proposal. It's a, it's a proposal as well where we have worked on it for for two years and we have really had more consultation on this proposal than I think on any other subject. So there was in the designing of the proposal a huge amount of uh, of consultation, and then the Commission adopts the uh, regulation. And then it is discussed in the, the council, which it means uh, with member states and then with, uh, with parliament. And it's the, uh, the end result. I mean, it is after all this that uh, uh, the regulation uh, um, is, uh, is finally adopted. And I think uh, there is a very inter interesting debate which is taking place right now um, under the Irish presidency. Um, and a very interesting debate uh, uh, also uh, in the parliament, uh, which, uh, and at the end of the day, we are going to have a, a, a text uh, uh, we, where um, a lot of people would have had the opportunity uh, uh, to give uh, their opinion. But uh, this uh, text, which is adopted by uh, majority, and uh, uh, that's the way the system um, operates, works. Uh, I was referring to Are you talking about, like, for instance, or, or are you referring to COPPA, or are you referring, for instance, as an example, or are you referring to, for instance, the um, uh, president's proposal for a privacy bill of rights? I mean, oh, no, the, uh, the, the COPPA. okay, so we have, sure, sure, sure. I'm sorry. Uh, 
um, excuse me. No, that's mine. That's probably my child asking for money or something. So just <laughs> one second. Um, sorry. Um, um, I'm sorry, so you, you want to know how companies have, uh, or, or how Europeans have um, input into yeah. our, okay. And would they have more under a, a trade agreement? Under a trade agreement? Um, I don't, I'm not going to comment on a trade agreement, right. but, but I can certainly tell you that we, when we propose um, rules, uh, we follow, uh, typically speaking, um, a, a law that uh, uh, requires anyone who wants to, to have input. And uh, many of the rules that we have done, and actually I should say, we do the same thing whether it's required or not, with respect to reports that we write, with respect to um, uh, uh, all sorts of activity that we're involved in, we seek a wide range of comments from all sorts of stakeholders. And we have received, I, I may get, um, some of the details wrong in terms of when the Europeans have uh, provided comment, but we have received comments from, for instance, the DPAs, the Data Protection Authorities, the Article 29 Working Party with respect to various efforts that we've been involved in. I, and by the way, I mean, I, I, for instance, met with the Article 29 Working Party. I meet with the DPAs a great deal through the International Conference of Data Protection and Privacy Commissioners. I am very involved with that group, so we have a lot of dialogue with them, but they also have commented formally in terms of both regulatory work we're involved in as well as policy work. And we take what they say um, seriously, just like we take all stakeholders' comments very seriously. Does that respond to your question? Um, yeah. Okay. Can I also add, uh, since you, you, you asked for uh, the input we had, um, we were very interested to have a, a formal letter from 25 consumer, U.S. consumer associations supporting the reform and uh, telling us to, uh, to go ahead. So it was uh, very interesting. And mm, no comment on that one. We had a question. <laughs> uh, <no. laughs> yes, hello. Uh, my name is Adam B. Sudi. I'm with Inside U.S. Trade. And I know you, you said you wouldn't comment about a trade agreement, but as the two sides um, you know, move towards negotiating a trade agreement, uh, one of the main issues is the free flow of data across borders. And uh, businesses in all sectors really want you know, binding rules allowing the flow of data, which you naturally run into issues of privacy when you look at that, when you look at that issue. I mean, to what extent, maybe in your current dialogue, are you addressing that issue? And you know, to what extent can the two sides address that issue in a trade agreement? And you know, and ultimately, you know, is there any chance that this could result in some sort of equivalence? You know, some sort of finding of uh, you know the systems being equivalent? Uh, you know, as a result of these these negotiations. We we really um, at the federal, despite the fact that trade is in our name. Um, this is really not what we do. There are lots of people in the US, G the U.S. government who are very deeply involved in that precise issue, and uh, it's very much under development and under discussion, but we uh, at the Federal Trade Commission are not involved in that. First of all, just a quick clarification on, on the law I mentioned. It, it has nothing to do with catching terrorists or organized criminals. It's purely to raise tax revenue for the for the Internal Revenue Service. So in terms of national security um, carve-outs, that doesn't apply. But my question was actually for um, Julie Brill. Um, pri privacy by design. Could you, and if any of the panelists want to jump, jump in, could you just talk a little bit about how much consensus there is for that, because I was at another panel about a year ago on this, and I think the White House lead person on this, um, it got very um, tense, because um, I think it's a Mr. White's, White. yeah, because when he pushed on it, he said the White House does not support privacy by design. And um, that's why I'd like to know, you know, how much consensus is there in the U.S. on this? Danny's a good friend of mine, so I wasn't there. I don't know what, what he, that, um, I, I won't comment on, on where Danny was. Uh, but he, of course, is no longer at the White House, but, that's, but I'm sure he was there when he was speaking. Um, privacy by design, I believe, is a concept that is uh, uh, gaining, growing 
consensus and growing acceptance. Um, I cannot comment in, in terms of whether it is uh, uh, universally been adopted by all segments of the ecosystem. But just to make sure we're on the same page, because again, maybe the previous conversation you had was about a particular element of privacy by design. Privacy by design is a concept that says that um, rather than thinking about privacy after you get a subpoena or you know a call from a regulator, instead to encourage companies to be thinking about privacy as they're building their products and services, to have it deeply embedded within the, um, the, 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 frame, the framework within which companies are operating. Um, and there's a lot of discussion about how this is moving forward, at least in the United States. You know, if you look at an organization like the um, Interna International Association of Privacy Professionals, the IAPP, that organization has grown by leaps and bounds over the past mm, three or so years, where now I believe it has on the order of up, over 10,000 members. Thank you. I was going to say over 12, and I wanted to make sure I was uh, not overestimating. I'm sure Richard's right. I have no, I have no doubt about that whatsoever. So, and this is just um, a, a tidbit of an example of the way in which pri people are really thinking about privacy, that you have CPOs, chief privacy officers, being um, uh, brought into the C-suites of corporations because I think everyone is recognizing the importance of trying to address these issues. And again, privacy by design plays a role in that because it is – uh, the notion that you're going to be thinking about this from the beginning. And just quickly, and I'm sure Mary has something to say about this as well, but, um, you know, I talk to a lot of different stakeholders. That's, that's how I view my job. I need to understand how things are working in terms of what we touch and what we do. Many of the older, more established companies have said to me, whether it's in the data broker world or in the online world, that, you know, they wish they had thought about privacy by design five or six years ago when they were developing their systems. The notion of trying to retrofit systems to, a, to deal with privacy is a much, much harder lift than it is to deal with some of these issues from the beginning. And that's what we're trying to encourage in terms of best practices and operationalizing privacy is this notion of if you think about it from the beginning, it's actually easier and it, 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 it becomes more um, cost effective and easier to do. So, but I'm, like I said, Mary, I'm sure has yep. things to say. No, I, I, we, we talk um, about privacy by design at our company as well, and it is a concept that uh, is, is quite alive where we are. Um, I have a group of lawyers who focus very specifically on privacy issues, but I also have a group of 75 or 80 lawyers who are embedded within all of the business groups at Microsoft, and I think every one of those lawyers would say that he or she knows a fair bit about privacy. They are you know, advising day by day by day as a feature is being developed on a new service or a new product. Uh, they are looking at screenshots. They are looking at startup menus. They are very much focused focused on this issue as part of a design element of the product. Now, Commissioner Brill is really quite right that you going back and retrofitting something is quite, quite difficult. And so old systems are really hard to go back and sort things out. But as we go forward and as we're developing new products and services, you know, I, I would tell lawyers originally you need to know a little something about copyright law, and now all the lawyers need to know more than a little bit about privacy law. Just a word on, uh, on this to say that we very much support privacy by design. You will find it in, in, into uh, the regulation. We think it's uh, very important. And uh, we also, in the intense consultation we had in designing this regulation, uh, many companies uh, told us that uh, they were um, including uh, privacy uh, very early in, uh, in uh, the design of their own programs or services and all this. And this makes sense. It's much more complicated, more costly to integrate uh, uh, privacy at a, at a late stage of the development of a program or a service. Um, I had a question. I'm Tyson Barker from the Bertelsmann Foundation. I had a question for Mrs. Uh, Braille. Um, you mentioned at the beginning, you know, that one of the ideas behind data protection, the idea is, one of the principles is control of your data. Um, I was wondering, with regard to the NIS directive, the directive coming out of the European Cybersecurity Strategy, 
if there is any discussion, we have this idea that there are compulsory um, disclosure requirements for companies in the event of breaches. Um, if there are breaches that deal with consumer data, are you guys talking to governments? Is there any element there that deals with disclosure requirements to those consumers as well? Not just to governments, that, that the private sector has to give governments the information, but either the private sector or government has to notify consumers. Uh, uh, perhaps a gray area. There are uh, breaches that could affect uh, intellectual property or critical infrastructure that uh, have an implication for both governments and for the company. There are other breaches that would include uh, personal information right. that would affect the, the consumer. And so the question is, do you treat them the same way? Do you make some sort of dividing line? So that's, that's really the issue. There's one set of uh, concerns that are security and public safety concerns and another set of concerns that are privacy concerns. But there may be some overlap. And so is that a fair? Uh, So, so we, we, we have not, uh, I mean, the question was to you, by the way. It was to me. I'm sorry. I try, I try hard. <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy to answer it in the U.S. perspective. No, please. Nice well, try, though. <laughs> <laughs> Well, well uh, you, you will find in um, both uh, instruments, uh, regulation and, uh, and, and directive uh, provisions on, uh, on data uh, breaches. Um, uh, of course, uh, they are, uh, of, uh, the principles are the same, but uh, the, uh, they are differentiated according to the, uh, to the, to, to the instruments and to, of course, uh, security again. Um, the novelty in uh, uh, the regulation is, of course, uh, that there is this uh, obligation to report uh, these data breaches. Uh, with a certain flexibility which has not uh, necessarily been seen uh, by those who read the, uh, the text uh, initially, um, uh, when, we, when we say that it has to be reported whenever possible uh, uh, in between 24 hours, uh, in, in the 24 hours. We, um, the, 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 the discussion continues on this, uh, this, uh, this provisions on, the, on, the, on data breaches and the, I guess uh, that they will be uh, uh, in the course of the uh, uh, future discussion uh, a clarification on how exactly on situation like the one you mentioned this is um, operating, uh, but uh, uh, it's still the subject of uh, discussion. Including question then, because this is an issue that I've uh, been wondering about for a long time. In, in the U.S., in some uh, regulatory approaches, more dealing with government information, there's a belief that some data is less sensitive than other data and that you can rank data and say that the less sensitive data requires a lighter treatment or engenders less concern. So the question might be when we think about it, and this is for all three of our panelists, is there any place where you could see consent being waived, consent being unnecessary? Or are there places, we know there's a few, where collection, even with consent, is unacceptable? Where do we draw these lines? And is there a way to think about this as saying there's some areas of data that we are willing to take a very light approach to, there's other areas where only the most strict approach can apply? Because one reason this was developed is that the notion that a one-size-fits-all model may not be the best serve the needs of a digital economy. Was that, uh, there was a question mark in there, but. Why don't I take a first crack at that? Because we've actually, what, um, I, we've actually addressed that. Is that okay, Francois? Uh, it's a very important question, and it's something that we at the Federal Trade Commission have thought a lot about. And we um, talk about, and this is particularly um, addressed in our big privacy report of a year ago. But you also see it reflected in various laws, some of the sectoral laws, for instance, HIPAA dealing with health information, COPPA dealing with children's information, and our new change with respect to the COPPA rule on geolocation. So what we said in our um, uh, big privacy report is consent and the need for different levels of consent 
should be contextual. It should depend upon the relationship between the user and the, 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 the website or the app or the browser, whatever it is. Um, we've also said that more sensitive information, that is information that is either financial, health, relating to children, we also mentioned geolocation, that is the bucket of information that in many circumstances should require an affirmative consent. But the context of the interaction, you know, if, if a consumer is on a particular website and the website needs to send that information to a fulfillment house in order to, to, to get the good to the, serve, to the consumer, like a book or whatever, you know, it, it doesn't seem to make sense to require the consumer to give consent to have their address provided to the fulfillment house, right? That's a, an example of the context of the transaction. We need to have this, th these rules make sense about when explicit affirmative consent is going to be required. So there is, we believe, a scalability of sensitivity, a scalability of the need for consent, and we are trying very hard to identify those areas where explicit consent is needed. One of the areas that we're developing through our case law is when there's a, there's a material change in the way information is used. So if you look at some of our large consent orders, we are going to be, we are saying that explicit consent is needed when there is a material retroactive change in the way data is being used. So again, that's, that's another one of those context, contextual um, uh, examples. So we, we noted, of course, the, the FTC's report, and we're, we're going along those paths exactly as Commissioner Brill is talking about that, too. And so for us, this notion of contextual consent is very important. I would note that it will get more complicated as, as more and more services come online with uses of information that you know we maybe are not contemplating today. And I think we'll also then have the question not only of contextual consent, but uh, uh, whether or not it is persistent consent or whether, um, you know, you'll need to ask more than one time if it's a particularly sensitive piece of information. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, of course, for us, um, uh, consent is very important. I mean, one, one uh, uh, thing I want to draw your attention to is that consent is not uh, the only base for uh, uh, data um, um, uh, privacy. There are plenty of other legal ways of uh, uh, processing data than uh, than consent. And in a way, uh, you have contracts, you have the uh, commercial uh, legitimate in interest. You have plenty of uh, other ways to be able to legally, to lawfully uh, process data than consent. But of course, consent is uh, very important. We want to clarify that uh, um, individuals again know what uh, they can expect for what they, they, they are doing. So does it mean that consent will be asked all the time? Uh, of course not. We are not going to click uh, uh, 50 times in a one-hour session on the internet. Uh, of course, there are many ways, uh, and the technology provides ways of, uh, of uh, dealing with it. But the, the, the important thing is that by your position with what happens now, uh, you are aware of what is going to happen to you, to your data. And there are plenty of practical ways of, um, of doing this, but uh, again, uh, this is for us a very important point. Well, we've reached the magic moment, and I'd like to ask you to join me in thinking a, a very thoughtful and articulate panel for their discussion of a complex issue. So if we could give them a round of applause. Please.